It's Saturday night. It's almost live. And it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's news thing. Competing in the bullshit Olympics tonight. Representing his country at the lowest level, it's Scott Capurro. Setting a new personal worst, it's Natasha Devon. And it's not the winning, it's the taking part. It's Bob Mills. Coming up, is this the week Trump finally went mental? Like actually mental? Like even more than before? And he's the reason you can't afford a holiday in the States this year or ever again. It's Brexiter at large, Nigel Farage. Hello and welcome to Sam Delaney's News Thing panel. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to think that maybe Donald Trump isn't the right person to take charge of the world's biggest economy and largest nuclear arsenal. This week, <laughs> he made one of his biggest gaffes yet when he appeared to suggest that his supporters should vote with their guns and assassinate his rival, Hillary Clinton. If she gets to pick her judges, nothing you can do, folks. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe there is, I don't know. But by Second Amendment people, he's referring to those American gun owners who think they can shoot any black teenager who comes within 100 yards of their property because some bloke in a wig wrote it on a bit of parchment with a fucking feather 200 years ago. To be fair to Trump, his core support base is almost entirely made up of brain-damaged, gun-toting misogynists, so asking them to assassinate Hillary Clinton is simply the best way to mobilise their support. What else is he going to do with them? Send them down the shopping centre? trying to force pamphlets onto sceptical Muslim women at gunpoint, it'd be bloody carnage. <laughs> Trump has got so mad that Liberals don't even know how to respond. Thing is, your modern, trendy young Liberal spends most of their life wandering around with their personal outrage already dialed up to 11, having a panic attack because Benedict Cumberbatch has failed to acknowledge all 14 types of gender in his latest bloody Snapchat, or a news anchor mentioned that a successful woman was also someone's wife. When Trump comes out with stuff like this, they've got nowhere to go. Their brain circuits get all fused together and they end up wandering along a canal towpath in a daze wearing only a dressing gown and trying to play Pokemon Go without a bloody phone. And that's not the only mental thing Trump has said this week, by the way. Here are some of his greatest hits since being chosen as the Republican candidate. He has insulted the parents of a dead soldier, said that women who are sexually harassed should just move jobs had a crying baby thrown out of a speech, accused Ted Cruz's dad of assassinating JFK, and <laughs> invited Russia to hack Hillary Clinton's email. You know, I was really looking forward to this election, Clinton versus Trump. I thought it was going to be one of the great American dramas, like Breaking Bad or Happy Days. But there are still three months left, and Trump has already ruined it by going peak mental way too early. Of course, the real losers are Republican voters. Polling shows that they are now abandoning their once proud party months before the election because they view Trump as unelectable, unstatesmanlike, and just plain weird. All this time, people are saying Trump is the next Hitler. He's not. He's the next Ed Miliband. Panel, is Trump already the worst election campaigner of all time, or could he still have something like a giant plinth up his sleeve? Scott? Well, he did say he wants to expel everyone from America who's not white, which is weird because he's orange. <laughs> <laughs> and we should try expelling the pumpkins and see how they... I, just, I think that if he wins, then orange is the new black because anyone who's even remotely alternative or interesting will, might leave the country in the hands of a sociopath. I think that he started this to kind of build his brand as a TV star and it got out of hand. I think he believes in himself now, which is terrifying. Mm. I mean, I think if we had one good candidate to fight against him, they would win hands down, but Hillary's got a lot of baggage. A lot, under her eyes and dragging behind herself. <laughs> she's got a lot of luggage she's carrying around. A lot, of, a lot of people don't trust her. This word, mental, keeps being used to describe Trump, not just by you, by pretty much everyone. Um, this is what mental looks like. I have a mental illness. Look at me being all calm, sitting here, being rational, saying rational You're things. not saying anything about building no, walls. No, Trump is stupid and an asshole. Mm. Um, so mental's not the correct word, <laughs> the correct word to use. But yeah, I think that the, this election campaign has turned into an unpopularity contest. It's who do you hate most? Pick the, the least bad of the two evils. And, and that's the reason that Hillary's coming out on top, because like you said, there's a lot of baggage there. Bob, the polls say there's no way he can win, but are we underestimating the American voter? 
I, I really believe we are. With the polls said, oh, Brexit, let them have yeah. their vote, let them have their vote, get it, and then we'll carry on as normal. I don't know. He's, uh, my worry is he's not stupid. My worry is he's just said, you know what, this is how I think. And I'm just going to tell them how I think. Mm -hmm. And if they, I've got, I've got another job. I'm a huge, big, multi-billionaire businessman. I'll tell them what I think. And if they then throw me out, then I'll just go back to business. And as the weeks have gone by, you must have thought, really? Mm. I, I can say that as well. <laughs> yeah. mm. I can because it is. And people are justifying. People are saying, well, I mean, when there's a problem with the economy, that's what you should do. You should start new infrastructure and. Think of the people employed on that wall. You know, that would get the economy <laughs> running. Yeah, uh, it's, it's like Roosevelt, isn't it? It's the New Deal all over again. Yeah. Let's start building walls all over the place. In, in very many ways, he's a socialist in that sense, yes. I would say. Yeah, Roosevelt wasn't an exclusivist or a racist. And Roosevelt actually was thinking about the country before his own interests. I mean, the office killed him. Uh, he died in office from exhaustion and, and overwork. I, I just think that Trump... Well, with any luck, that would be one good side effect of Trump well. getting elected. <laughs> might be he doesn't so exhausted worry, he doesn't by worry. all this wall building, he, he drops dead. This building wall thing is so silly because, you know, Mexicans can build doors and <laughs> ladders. They're really good with locks. I just think that, you know, that's been discussed in the U.S. for 250 years, building borders, building walls. That's all ridiculous. It's this old school stuff. Thanks, man. I think we've learned a lot here. <laughs> I have a lot. Uh, this week, lovable, unacceptable panto racist joker Christopher Biggins has been kicked off Big Brother. Take a moment to think what ground that covers. I mean, a housemate once fucked herself with a wine bottle and didn't get chucked off Big Brother. Biggins made an unacceptable joke to fellow housemate Katie Wasel, who's Jewish. I only mention that because it's an important element in what happened next. Just to be clear, I'm not interested in racially profiling the celebrities of Britain. I'll leave that to tonight's special guest who's coming up later. <laughs> the former X Factor contestant was standing in a queue by the Big Brother bathroom when Biggins turned to her and said, you better be careful or they'll be putting you in the showers and taking you to a room. I'm not quite sure that's what happened in the Nazi death camps, Biggins. I, I think it was just the showers. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, yeah. I don't know where he's come up with this second room theory. Mind you, I don't think many of us had Biggins pegged as a leading Holocaust historian. The closest Biggins ever came to a war crime is when Captain Hook tried to feed the Lost Boys to that crocodile with the alarm clock at the Watford Palace Theatre in 1997. After dealing with the Holocaust, Biggins moved on to AIDS. Crikey, his act really has changed <laughs> in recent times, hasn't it? And what they didn't realise, that there were a lot of bisexuals who went to those countries yeah. and had sex with those people yeah. and then brought it back to their own families yeah. in America. Oh, really? So that's yeah. how it became such a worldwide disease. Wow. I remember the last time I felt this outrage by controversy. It was back in the year 2000. Big Brother was on TV for the very first time and one housemate, Nick Bateman, did something so heinous, so despicable, that he became the most hated man in Britain. Had he pinned down the Queen, given her a Chinese burn and shit in her handbag? No. Had he dressed up a bulldog in a beef eater's hat and bummed it on Remembrance Day? No, he hadn't done that either. Had he made light of Hitler's attempts to exterminate the Jews? No. What he'd done was smuggled in a pencil. He was a pencil smuggler. The Pablo Escobar of pencils. Nasty Nick Bateman was the nation's most reviled man for sneaking into a toilet cubicle and writing the name Craig on a piece of paper. You can pretty much chart the downfall of Western civilization through Big Brother controversies. Not long after we were calling for Nasty Nick's public execution, a drunk woman named Kinga pleasured herself with that wine bottle to impress Anthony, who could dance a bit like John Travolta, who Mikosi later shagged for three seconds in a hot tub. Then there was that time Bollywood actress Shilpa Shetty got racist abuse off of Jade Goody, R.I.P., and Joe out of S Club 7, who called her Shilpa Poppadom. And now, Biggins. Big Brother might be an unloved shadow of its former self, but it remains the nation's most reliable source of outrage. Panel, the Big Brother house is just a house, though, Scott. Yes. And this is a country where we have freedoms. It's a house just like that which you and I may live in. And these are the sort of things that are going on in houses up and down the land, all of our houses every night, right? Really? Yes. I assume. You mean Holocaust jokes? 
Yeah, yeah, all sorts of fruity ironies fruity. might, well, might, why you might when be you say that? spouted <laughs> on right, sofas yeah, yeah. around the country. I love discussing HIV and AIDS around the dinner table. It's, I bring it up every time. And sort of, it's almost like fan fiction, yeah. isn't it? It's like, let's all make up stories mm. of what went down in the Holocaust or how AIDS was invented. Right, mm. invented. That, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's what he was doing, right. wasn't I he? I knew where he was going with that story, too. I've heard that story before. Right. It's yeah. a fun it game is, for all the family. Much, <laughs> it, is, yeah. Yeah. it is very much like an average British house. It's very much like my house in that it's filthy and it's usually full of people I don't recognise. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think he was a bit tipsy and out of place, and I've met him a couple of times. He's a sweet guy. He, just, he was trying to make her laugh, and it got out of hand. He probably doesn't even know why he's been kicked out now. He's probably wanting the streets in that same horrible tie-dye blouse, wondering, like, you know, <laughs> where's my free whiskey? Yeah, what went wrong? What did I do? Bob, is it only basically nutters who get offended by things they see and hear on TV? Well, I wouldn't say nutters because I don't believe that's a word you should bandy around. I think you should oh, take no, not mental health again. a little bit more seriously. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the perfect position to kiss her ass right now, so well done. Nutters is all right. No, Nuts, no. Nutters actually is a, a recognised and sensitive ment term mental in the health, mental health, health arena. That, and that's why I've replaced... So you're saying, are mental. crazy fucks the only ones who get nervous yeah. about things said yeah. on TV? Is that what you're saying? Not people with mental illness. Why would you watch that? You it, don't okay. watch that programme unless you want to get but, outraged. Yeah. It's only idiots who get outraged by things on TV. Social retards is what you're trying to say. Is that correct? Yeah. They might be the words you would use. Right. I don't know if even, they're idiots. They're just people like my mum, bless her, yeah. who thinks, oh, I've not a lot going on in my life. I'm in my 80s, but I'll tell you what is good. Getting outraged. <laughs> That's nice. That's a, it's a sensation. It keeps your juices yeah. flowing and off you go. I don't want to talk about my mother's juices. How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> why do you keep saying juice? I don't know why, why you brought that up. Juice? In many why? ways, you're the real hate preacher here, Natasha. Am I? Talking about his mum and her juices. <laughs> yeah. Some of the language... You, I mean, it's rich you coming in and lecturing us on language with some of the things you've been saying, the sexual terms you've been banning about. But please... Go on. Isn't it idiots who get outraged? <laughs> um, I, I'm having an out-of-body experience <laughs> right now. Uh, no, I was, I was thinking about this uh, in terms of young people, because they get a lot of flack for, for saying, I find that offensive, or, or that's not the correct term, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But isn't that a good thing, that if we're progressing towards a time when people are more mindful of the language that they use and how it might impact people, surely that's progression, that's evolution. Yeah. Well, surely yeah. we should celebrate I mean, that. They used to say all sorts of racist terms on TV as recently as the 70s. In yeah. fact, I was looking at... Only Fools and Horses clips the other day, and even in the 80s, they were saying all sorts of terms that nowadays you'd be right out in the Big Brother house. Yeah. Or you'd be running for president of the US. Yeah, yeah. perhaps so. There you yeah. go. Thanks, panel. Uh, okay, now it's time for our very special guest. Came from nothing to destroy the European Union. Survived cancer, a plane crash, and his own resignation. Member of the European Parliament for 17 awkward years. Named Britain of the Year in 2014. A man of the people. If the people are angry northerners and drunk Essex housewives, it's Nigel Farage! Yes, and thanks for joining us, Nigel. We'll be talking to Nigel about some of the most pressing political issues of our day a little later. But first, let's make sure he feels at home here at News Thing Towers. There we go. All right, let's take this over to Nigel. That is a drop of uh, Theakston's, Nigel, especially for oh, you, that we got thank in. Thank God for that. I thought you'd never offer. Yeah, exactly. Well, we like to look after people here. Now, uh, we're going to play a little game before we get on to our oh, chat. Very good. How is that? Well, Paul? It's excellent. Very good. Top job. Um, part of your appeal, Nigel, yes. is that you've got the common touch. Uh, you say what the man in the pub is thinking. But let's look at the facts. You went to an elite public school. Uh, you had a career in a city firm, traded, traded million pound stocks. And you go to garden parties with Rupert Murdoch. So, <laughs> doesn't sound that well, normal. I'm guilty on the last one. It doesn't sound that normal. But let's find out how much of a man of the people you really are as we play our game. But how much of a man of the people are you really, Nigel Farage? We've gone around the country to find some ordinary people with ordinary everyday problems and dilemmas. Let's see if you can give us the solution to their problems. Uh, let's take a look at the first one. 
My wife is always banging on about the recycling. It just gets more and more complicated every week. So what I'm going to do is, on a Sunday when she's at tennis, I'm going to stick it all in a shopping trolley and then chuck that in the canal. That's all right, isn't it, Nigel? Well, he's right to be sceptical about recycling. Mm. A complete load of old baloney. Mm. Uh, most of it goes on ships and gets dumped in landfill sites in China. So he's right, yeah. in essence, to be sceptical about it. But don't dump it in the canal. I mean, the people want to... Go fishing and Why swim not? there and do Why things not? like that. I mean, what are canals used for these days? Well, there's I mean, fish when we were in them. Kids, we used to always them. chuck the rubbish in the canal. Yeah, well, do you know what? I wouldn't necessarily call myself modern man. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, you've got quite a swishy moustache these days. Right. Is this part of a crisis now you've quit your job? Yes, it is. I'm looking for a new identity. I'm okay. struggling. I'm struggling. Right, no, like don't it. dump it in the canal, please. OK. Right, let's take a look at the second mm. ordinary man in the street dilemma. My new bird's got this cat and she's fucking mad about it. Like, she lets it sleep on her bed and I've got to do, like, a special cat voice for it and everything. I'm thinking of just sticking it on a train up north and just letting it loose. What do you reckon, Nigel? <laughs> well, I don't know. Animal cruelty. We can't condone that sort of thing, can we? Well, it's not cruelty. He's got this problem, and I don't know if you've experienced this, where a woman makes you treat a pet as if it's, like, your child. And it, it, for a lot of men, that's annoying. So some men would do something worse. He's just saying, let it free. Let what, it free by, by, and pretend by, to her that it's got lost. So you truck it on the overnight sleeper from Houston to Inverness? That's exactly what he's proposing. Well, it's better than the alternative, isn't it? OK, so you're endorsing that one. Well, I'm not endorsing it, but if you're saying the alternative is to do something really horrible to it... Or he could learn to just live with the cat. Uh, he could be patient, he could be tolerant, he could be understanding. Those are none of the things that you've ever endorsed in the past. Yeah, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any pets? Uh, guinea pigs. Is that right? Guinea pigs. Couple of, a couple of guinea pigs. But I have, I've got to confess, been a cat owner in the past. What, what was your cat called? Boris. Is that true? No, honestly, it was, it was a Burmese cat called Boris. Yep. But not after your no, erstwhile colleague. No, no, no. This was years before. OK. Uh, OK, final dilemma. Right. I'm a man in his 40s and I've been living a lie my whole life. I'm thinking of coming out of the closet. But I'm riding the boys down the pub are going to give me flack for it. And I'm a builder. My boss is homophobic, so I'll probably get fucking sacked. What should I do, Nigel? I tell you what, this is one way in which the world has moved on. Nobody down the pub could care less. He reckons his mates have got unreconstructed views on homosexuality. People couldn't care less. People just couldn't care. They couldn't give a damn about it. He, why do you think he has got all the way into his 40s remaining in the closet? He thinks because... society does care. Well, 20 years ago it did. 30 years ago even more so. Uh, 50 years ago, it was a criminal offence. You, you know, you, you, you could go to the nick for it. No, I, th I think things have changed completely, and I think people that come out today are really surprised that actually no one cares. What about his boss, who reckons he might sack him for being gay? It's just not going to happen, is it? Um, you're very comfortable with your sexuality, judging by this moustache as well, because that does look quite village people. Oh no, it? don't! Oh no, it'll have to go there, won't it? No, look, I couldn't, I couldn't care less what people do in the bedroom, and not with anybody else. Thanks for that, Nigel. Sit tight, finish your pint. We'll be talking to you in more detail in part two. And I will also be asking, now that we've got our country back, why have we decided to give it all to China? See you in a minute. Welcome back. One of the numerous side effects of Nigel Farage indulging his mad personal vendetta against the EU is that Britain now has to make friends with China. It's like at school when you dump your old mates and claim you're really happy about it until you realise you have to spend your lunch break with the mathletes, who are a bit boring, very serious and really demanding of your time. The Chinese had a major stake in Britain's Hinkley Point C nuclear power station, but Theresa May has delayed the project over fears of China dabbling in nuclear espionage. Fair enough. But the Chinese aren't happy, and their ambassador came out with some threatening statements about not doing business with Britain again. And that would leave Britain completely up shit creek. Why? Well, maybe you need me to explain a bit more about China, who are rapidly becoming the most important country in the world. Let's start with the basics. Who are China? Well, they're the biggest country in the world. They've got a population 20 times the size of ours and the world's largest army. They've also got nuclear weapons. And they all eat Chinese food for every single meal. Sounds a bit much, doesn't it? Not for them. They love it. What do they want? They used to be full-on communists, which meant we didn't have to worry about them muscling in on our turf. 
because they were too busy singing to old men in suits and occasionally starving. Now they've ditched all that and are banging to make him profit and they want to run all our nuclear power plants. It's a bloody nightmare. What are their chances? 100%. They are definitely going to take over the world. Was Mr Miyagi Chinese? Let's put this one to bed once and for all. Mr Miyagi wasn't Chinese. Mr Miyagi was japa fucking -ese. Worse than that, the actor was actually born in America, so he's barely even Japanese. I know what you're about to say. What about the one with the milky eye who was in Gremlins? Is he Chinese? Yes, he was Chinese. He's as Chinese as the day is long. Wasn't that actor also the wizard Egg Shen in Big Trouble in Little China? No, he wasn't. That was a different bloke who's also Chinese. You see, if you want to do business with China, you have got to get this right. I've got a simple rhyme to help you remember, which is this. Mr Miyagi is bound to please, that's because he's Japanese. But if there's milky eyes upon your man, then he's from China, not Japan. And if not them, <laughs> but the other one, he's also not from the land of the rising sun. Simple. Panel. They're going to be bloody livid if we bail on this big deal we've got with them. I love they? China. I mean, I use my iPhone all the time. And uh, <laughs> I, love, I love the fireworks. I think Chinese guys are hot. Uh, closest I'll ever come to fucking woman. I love... Uh, <laughs> I love, uh, love the DVDs. I think they're great. You know, it's, it's great culture, right? But uh, back off. Natasha, the reason China have become so powerful is that we left them to it when they said they were communists. Now they say they're not communists. So basically they've tricked us, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, it does feel that way. You know, when I was a kid, I used to get, uh, like, a pound pocket money every week. But to, in order to earn that pocket money, there were certain chores I had to do. And my least favourite one was I had to dust the skirting boards in our house, which I hated because I had to snuffle around like a truffle pig. And one week I was like, no! I'm not doing it. So my parents said, OK, you don't get your pound. And then I suddenly realised that I wouldn't be able to buy, uh, you know, the penny sweets or whatever that I wanted. And that sad little story I just told you, mm. that is what Britain is doing right now. We've gone, no, we want to make our own rules, no compromise, we're going to do what we want. We've suddenly realised that actually we might need a few friends. Yeah. I thought that was going to be a brilliant story where you <laughs> say, I had to do the thing. And in the end, I thought, well, no, I've got a pound. I could give half of that to a little Chinese kid <laughs> and then yeah. they'd clean it for me. I, I'll admit, I was disappointed it didn't end with some sort of interaction with the Chinese <laughs> people. <laughs> Absolutely. I was, have you been to China? I've been to China. Yeah. I'm going China. in November. Yeah, the difference is I've been. All right. <laughs> 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 and when you go there, you know what they do? When you, they've got beautiful parks and you walk through them and you're walking through and, and then suddenly music appears. From, appears. from these speakers. There are speakers all over. And people stop and they start dancing. No. They do Tai Chi or they dance. Mm. Is this true or is this just so no, I'll, I'll it... start throwing shapes in the middle no, of a Chinese this street? Is absolutely true. Okay. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. My wife said, Oh, isn't that beautiful, isn't that beautiful, isn't that beautiful? And I was thinking, that's too organized. Mm. <laughs> you know the thing when you were told at school that if all the people in China jumped up and down at the same time, there'd be a tidal wave. Yeah. Yeah. When you spend you only spend an hour there and you think they could organise that. <laughs> Can we really that. trust people who are that frivolous that they stop and dance yes, in everyday no. life to run exactly. our nuclear power? Yeah. It's a and very also, safe place, China. I was there and I, there's no... They, they don't have any car accidents. They don't, right? Did you notice that? There were no car... I think it's because they kill all the girl babies. But I think... <laughs> I think one thing to remember. I think one Come to the dark side. Thank you. I think I see it home. I didn't anyway. see that coming. Ultimately, what I've learned from this discussion is that China don't need nuclear power because they could all just jump and down, up and down. They can jump up and down. They can yeah. generate a lot of yeah. kinetic That's their energy. Trump card. Uh, thanks, panel. Thank you. <laughs> there now follows a message from the Right Honourable Jeremy Corbyn, leader of Her Majesty's opposition. Hello there. I'm Jeremy Corbyn the leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> That's right, I'm the fucking leader. Get used to it. When I heard Tata Steel were about to shut down their factory in Port Talbot, I hopped in the Beamer and shot down the M4 quick smart. This is a fucking disaster, I thought. There's one thing I know about Taps. They're better off down a mine digging steel or coal or whatever the fuck they're up to down there. They're being sold down the river by this Tata lot. Indians? <laughs> Fucking cowboys, more like. 
Welcome back to our special guest, Nigel Farage. Uh, Nigel, it's good to have you on the show. Um, do you ever, ever feel in the tiniest bit responsible for the atmosphere of hostility, particularly that which we read about following the Brexit mm. result towards foreigners and immigrants in this well, country? Any pangs of guilt about that? Let's just be fair. There were some horrendous things said by both sides. Uh, there were some on the Brexit side who hurled racist abuse at, at Polish people or whatever. Yeah, it happened, all right? Equally, uh, there were some on the Remain side who, who sent insults and threats through social media to those who were prominent on the Brexit side. Let me just say this to you. Do I feel responsible for people saying extreme things? Quite the reverse. I destroyed the British National Party. Right? We had a far-right party in this country who genuinely were you know, anti-Jew, anti-black, and all of those things. And I came along and I said to their voters, if you're holding your nose and voting for this party as a protest, don't. Come and vote for me. I'm not, I'm not against anybody. I just want us to start putting British people first. And I almost single-handedly destroyed the far-right in British politics. That's not a bad achievement. Right, so you don't feel uh, in the least bit... If they, do you feel that there's the, the sort of public discourse around these issues have, has soured recently since Brexit? If I hadn't been around and done what I'd done, that strain of opinion would have been represented by Nick Griffin and the BNP and would genuinely have been motivated by hate. I'm not motivated by that. I never have been. I'm not against anybody. Actually, one of the arguments I've made is that by leaving the EU, we can start getting closer to India and all of our Commonwealth friends and partners. Um, were you really a fascist when you went to school? No, of course not. We've had this for years, and it goes on and on There's, and This on. is a new one, isn't it? What is it, former classmate of yours? He said that you yeah. used to write your initials NF like National Front and went through a village chanting gas well, this, this, is, this is just ludicrous, some of this stuff. Right. Look, the fact is, I was... I, I, I bought into the Thatcher project in 1978. I was a fan of Thatcher. I thought a lot of what Enoch Powell had said, particularly about the common market, was absolutely right. And that was considered by some, you know, lefty sort of 60s students type, types who were teaching me to be awful. Mm -hmm. um, and did I, at times, uh, you know, wind people up and take the piss a bit? Yes. What about Stephen Wolf? What a stitch up that was. He didn't get his forms in on time. Silly boy. I like Stephen. He would have been great. He would have been, of all the people who could have succeeded me, he would have been the best. Great backstory. You know, comes from the Moss side, council estate, quarter Jamaican, as you, as you probably know. Uh, you know, all of that stuff. Did well, became a barrister, made money. Great backstory. A uh, little bit of stardust about Stephen. He made a mess of it. But do you think he's been stitched up? Do you no. think there were dark forces at play here? No, I don't. I think he made a mess of it. You know, he had to get his forms in by midday to be a candidate. He didn't do it. There, uh, what about... So, who, who are you backing now? No one. Come off it. No one. I spoke to Lisa Duffy in the week. She yeah. was livid about Muslims wearing veils. And I'm like, fuck me, isn't there other stuff we should be worried about than what people <laughs> wear on their heads? You may be right. I'm not going to interfere. You know, I am the, I am the retiring party leader, let them sort it out. Well, that's your attitude to the country. You no, it is. You guys out your head, yeah, let them sort out. It. Your party, <laughs> which you have got this far, yep. they're a blood... They, Stephen Wolf's out of the picture, they're in a bloody mess now. Look, they've had 25 years of my life. I reckon that's enough. Nigel Farage, it's been a pleasure Thank to have you. you here. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks also to my panel, Scott Capuro, Natasha Devon and Bob Mills. And I'm told we've already had some complaints coming in that I have singularly failed to trick Nigel into saying something racist. But please understand, this man has been successfully batting that stuff away for years, some of the finest journalists in the world. I mean, if Kay Burley can't do it, then what fucking hope does a dope like me have, right, Nigel? <laughs> but there's no racism there. That's the point. All I wanted was my country back and my borders back. Come on. Yeah, he snookered me. Get See over you next it. Week. Get over it, everybody.